Joining the show today is Puck Daddy slash Yahoo former blogger, <laughs> now turned ESPN national writer, Greg Wyshynski. Thanks for joining us, Wish. Yeah, I'm still Puck Daddy when I do the uh, betting shows on ESPN, although I can't bet on hockey anymore because I don't know if you guys heard, but we have our own sports book now. There are like wow. rules they put in place for journalists, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the, the the Puck Daddy legacy lives on uh, in some way, shape, or form. I wish I was I was assumed it was going to be like Doctor Who, where like you know someone <laughs> else would just take the Puck Daddy mantle after I left, but it didn't it didn't work out that way for some reason. As long as it lives on, right? Yeah, right. In some way, shape, or form. Plus, plus the drop co-host, right? So the the drop uh, plus the drop co-host, yeah. 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 Me, and, me and yeah, producer Bon Vivant. Yeah, me and Ardo Cal have a digital show and a podcast. If you haven't heard it, called The Drop. It's uh, Monday and Thursday um, on YouTube, and then wherever you get your podcast. It's been a fun show. It's like uh, I feel uh, the, the the whole gist of it was that we wanted to kind of like create um, sort of ancillary coverage that wasn't being given by our our TV and 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 uh, other facets of our NHL coverage and. And so we bring some irreverence. We bring some debate. It's 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 a fun show. I think it's a nice compliment to what, what happens on television. Nice. And I mean, just for people to understand, more or less unhinged than MVSW. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> less unhinged by this by the sense that that my co-host, while Canadian, is not making references to the 1967 <laughs> Stings second power play. <laughs> um, and and I think he's he's much less tatted up than Merrick uh as well so um yeah, you know it's a different it's definitely a different kind of fun than uh, than what jeff and i have but the good news <laughs> is that jeff and i still have fun every wednesday i get to hop on his show uh his national canadian show and uh and do, we do like basically we call it mvsw redux um but we do like about 40 minutes every week together um i don't know how he backdoored a uh a, a, a fake podcast on a radio show but um he managed to do it so it's cool it's cool to be able to to work with him again in some way shape or form yeah i'm, I'm one of the psychos that has been part of the jeff merrick cult for a couple of years here and uh <laughs> yes i i don't know how to explain it it's uh it's always interesting you never know what's coming but uh you're, you're gonna hear stuff that you're not ready for <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's that was why we worked well together i mean is that he he and i are both people that get uh, I think both get a little weird in our commentary and analysis in, in using examples that might not necessarily be what you'd find in a game story <laughs> to describe <laughs> the action, uh, historical references, drug references, things of that nature. And I think the cool thing about both him and me was that um, we'd also get really bored with the usual conventions of, of sports commentary and would just take take the show in, in very weird places. And And both of us were very adept at, at rolling with those punches. Like I think there was a, a point this week on, on his show when he he made a he made a capital city uh, this he made a reference to it's not Springfield it's capital city, uh, which then began an entire run of um, this team is dancing Homer and this team is the capital city goofball. <laughs> like just a full a full a full five minutes of Simpsons references that I don't think you're necessarily getting when two other Gen X white guys talk about hockey. <laughs> Yes, I, I am fully here for the obscurity. Mm -hmm. And to that point, first thing we ask all of our guests, Minnesota Wild logo is a unique one. And yeah. just Rorschach test. First time you looked at it, what did you see? Oh, I saw I saw a bear head. I thought it was like a bear, um, like a like a with a bear snout is what I thought it was when I first saw it. Um, and, and maybe the fact that there are so many trees in the logo made my my mind immediately go to bear. Um, I've got less problem with the logo than I do with the name. <laughs> I've, been no thinking about the wild, I've been thinking about the wild a lot recently because of all the Utah talk and like, you know, <laughs> talking about being the blizzard or, or whatever. Yeti. And the Yeti. I mean, and that's the thing too about, you know, like the canonically Yetis is the plural of Yeti. And yet in their vote, it's just Yeti, which means it's a singular Yeti. Um, it, they're, they're not fish. You can't say <laughs> Yeti and mean a, a pack of, of Yetis. So that's going to really bug me too. Like, I, I love the name. I think, I think Yetis is a, is a dope name. And I, and I love the connotation of like, 
they already have this inherent rivalry with with Denver um, in the sense that Salt Lake City and Denver, I, I've discovered, are, are very much at each other's at each other's throats about who is the true king of winter sports in the United States. <laughs> um, and so the idea that, you know, the, the avalanche have the Bigfoot patch on their arm and then you have a team called the Yeti is it's like a natural rivalry already. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's going to it's going to bug the shit out of me when they're Yeti <laughs> and not Yeti. I got to be honest with you. Uh, uh, so, so many times when I wrote at the paper, they I usually say lightning is versus lightning are because it's a singular word. So it's just like draw people crazy there, kind of say what, yeah. what do you call it in when you're but, writing and for AP style, you know. But but at least when at least with the lightning, you know, there is a a plural version. It's bolts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, there is no there is no short form plural version of wild. Uh, man no bear pigs. Form. What? Man bear pigs. Man -bear pigs. Well, yeah, <laughs> sure, but not not a widely a widely disseminated plural version of wild. Um, again, like if you're the if you're the Yetis, you know, best be the Yetis because there's no way you're going to be able to come up well, come up with a plural um, alternate, you know, name for that team. Well, the name of our pot is Fellowship of the Rink, as you saw, to our Lord of the Ring fandom. Uh, one of many things that I'm passionate about, including karaoke. I was curious, what is your favorite nerddom you have? I know what kind of Favorite series you watch? Or I know you're a trivia king. I know we played trivia together back in the day at a brewery in, in St. Pete. So, like, what's your like the your fandom? I guess that you have. Well, the nerdiest fandom fandom is definitely Mystery Science Theater 3000, if only because I, I think it's very much now out of the cultural zeitgeist, um, and most people, I think, there's a good number of people who have heard about it because they've asked about my Twitter avatar. Which is uh, Joel Hodgson and and the two the two puppet robots from back in the '90s, and it's a very meaningful show for me because um, it's the show that informed my sense of humor. Um, it's a show that you know obviously spoke to me as a as a fantasy and sci fi nerd because they cover a lot of those movies. But it's also a place where I learned that you you can make references in your work to things that people don't know. And, and it's beneficial because then they'll go and search it out. And so a lot of the humor on that show were references that I did not understand when I was a kid, but I was curious about them. And so I went and tried to find out what they were talking about, like making, making, you know, delightful Minnesota, nice references to like putting the pan fish down and things of that nature. <laughs> like, you know, like, it's just like stuff I didn't know. And, and so it, it taught me as a writer um, and as a, as a, as a podcaster that it does, you don't always have to just play to the play to the cheap seats. Like you can, you can be smart and you can be obscure and, and you can assume that even if people don't get it, that maybe they'll try to find out what it is on their own. And and I always thought that was a really it was a real breakthrough for me as a writer. But I, I don't know. The show's great. And 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 I um for those that don't know, it's a guy and two robots making fun of movies. Uh it's still <laughs> on uh Pluto TV. You can find an entire channel on Pluto TV. And that Pluto TV has been a real, a real um a real miracle for me in the sense that it's a it's a place where all of the old TV is and you don't have to pay for it. And I have four channels in a row. That's all Top Chef episodes, Iron Chef episodes, Bar Rescue episodes, and then Mystery Science Theater 3000 running 24-7. And like, I mean, there are times when I just want to like <laughs> slip into a coma and just stay on the couch for an entire day and, and, and flip between those four things. And, and some don't even know that, that that's not you in your uh, picture on Twitter we recently saw. Uh, it, it happens once a month and it, and it always happens in the same context, which is I say something um, snarky and then somebody comes back with me to make fun of the way I look and they assume I look like Joel Hodgson. <laughs> and the thing that always bothers me about it, like I don't I don't assume people know what Mystery Science Theater 3000 is anymore. That's fine. It's it's obscure. It's it's old. It's It's, you know, a show for my youth, even if they make new episodes for Netflix time and again. Um, the thing that bothers me is like, why would you possibly think that's me in the photo posing with two puppets? Like it's a guy next to a, 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 a puppet with a, a re, 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 like a backwards lacrosse net for a head next to a little red guy with little squiggle arms 
and a gumball machine head. And then there's what they assume is me. And I'm like, in what context do you think that pos that photo would possibly be my avatar as a professional hockey writer if it is not from some other place that is not like, like, did they think I went to like a department store and did a photo shoot with two puppets and, and then me in a jumpsuit? Like, where where did they think this was from? That'd be a hell of a story. Like, you know, those Sears, J.C. Penney have those little photo shoots with like the families and stuff like that there and stuff. Yeah, it's like the, it's, it's a picture of me and then like a dreamy picture of Tom Servo over in the corner. How they used to do those photos. I don't know. It's weird, but it's always really funny, and it actually is kind of uh like um touching how many people are are, are just like in on the joke. And uh, and like I'll make comment on it and about like oh here we go again, and then people will be like you know jump in on Twitter and be like well at least they didn't make fun of your robot friends I'm like that's true they did not make fun of my robot friends I just thought I was a balding Midwestern man. A new fandom you're part of now is probably being a girl dad. Uh, it's being uh, Iris is a year old probably now. No, she, no, born in January. Uh, so she's a freshie. Yeah, I, I'm a two-time two girl dad. I have an older daughter named Vivian who's 13, and um, and Iris is is a newbie. Um, and, and so that's been interesting to not only you know do the job with a newborn a little bit a little bit more tired than I think I've been in previous years, uh, but also like the 13 year spread of, of of fatherdom has shown me that technology has grown in leaps and bounds. Like the idea that there's a machine that can desanitize de bottles and a machine that can properly distribute formula uh, with a few presses of a button is like, wow, this is something I really could have used 13 years ago. Um, Vivian's awesome. She is a huge Devils fan, which was by design. I tried to do my best to make her <laughs> into a hockey fan and she loves the Devils and particularly loves the Hughes boys. Um, but the unexpected thing that happened is that she's a New York Mets fan, which I don't know how that happened, man. The last thing I heard was that kids don't like baseball. I think she became a fan right as they sped the game up um, with the with the pitch clock and everything, so it became more palatable for for maybe her. Um, but I don't know how it happened. But like she, the only thing she wants to do is go to Mets games, and uh, and I I'm, I'm happy about that that I've made a baseball fan. But I'm also sad about that because she's a Mets fan. <laughs> <laughs> like I protected her. She's not a Jets fan. I protected her from that pain, but the Mets, the Mets fan, <laughs> is its, own, its own pain. Yeah, I figured you'd have some. Scott and his wife had their first child in December, and my wife's due pretty much any day now. So, um, yeah. always looking for always looking for advice on whether it's creating fandoms for your kids or just kind of survival uh, in the first uh, few months. Well, the the interesting thing about Viv Vivian was that her first hockey game was actually a national women's hockey league game in Jersey. It was a riveters game. You know, my wife and I took her there cause we assumed that that would be a fun like entry point for her. Here's girls playing hockey kind of thing. And, uh, and, and the, the whole game, she was kind of into it until the very end when this one player in Madison Packer on the riveters uh, almost started a fight. And like then, like all of the the synapses started firing in her little hockey fan brain, and she's like, "Wait, wait a second, well, this is this is what it is." And I'm like, "Okay, we got her." So then, like the next game we took her to was like a Devils game, and she was all in after that. Line brawl, right? Well, I mean, she comes on at a time when it's not about fighting anymore, but she clearly like the physicality of it. I think was what surprised her, yeah. and and so I think that's where she sort of like it, it clicked for her. What? What's Vivian's thoughts on the hiring of Sheldon Keefe? I tried to ask her about it the other day, and she she was asking me more than anything. Um, I don't think she really thinks coaches matter, which I think is a very uh, Gen you know Gen Z reaction to coach hirings. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, I, I like I said on the drop this week, I uh, I think that from a defensive systems standpoint, I really like what he did in Toronto. And the Devils clearly need to figure out how to play defense better. And the idea of defense to offense, I mean, it's what the Leafs did pretty well under Keefe. If there was one thing they excelled at, it was probably that. I, I've talked to some people that say he's not the biggest guy when it comes to building culture. And that gives me a little bit of pause because that's, to me, what the team really needs. I think there's a, a little inmates running the asylum going on in Jersey. And, and I would have liked to have seen a, a Craig Brube or, you know, if they ever were able to wrangle him away, Mike Sullivan come in to really kind of 
lay down the law, give them some structure mm -hmm. and be the, the alpha, you know, and I, I, I'm not saying Sheldon couldn't be that. I just, it's just not, that's not his track record yet. And so that's what concerns me. But the thing that I think is interesting is sort of the reaction of, I, I've talked to a lot of people that, that know him and a lot of people in the coaching community. And they're like, this is a good hire. Like this is a guy whose second um, job is going to be a real good one. Right. And and then I, everybody I know in Toronto is just like, what are they doing? <laughs> like, what do they think? Yeah. This guy sucks. <laughs> and, and I, and I, and I found it interesting like if you take a if you take a step back and really think about it, you know he had more success in Toronto than any coach has had since two thousand four. You know Ron he didn't Ron Wilson didn't have his success. Randy Carlisle, um, Mike Babcock, none of these guys had the success that he had. He won a playoff round, and so there's a certain amount of trying to figure out what the expect what the expectation should be vis a vis a guy who didn't win in the playoffs in a normal sense of the definition but a guy who was extremely successful in the playoffs by the toronto definition you know what i mean yeah i well, mean like, it, what's the, like what's like the magic elixir in toronto right they've had uh, experienced coaches they've had coaches who won a cup they've had you know keep was the guy who kind of grew up in their system you know it's hard to see any many changes being happened that are seismic changes like what's the magic elixir in, in getting this over the, the hump here um there I, I I enjoyed the discourse about their playoff loss because I think it mm -hmm. came back to a very interesting place, which is that despite having elite talent in, in some places on this team, it's not necessarily elite talent that all adds up to being a champion. And, and so Morgan Riley's a really good defenseman. He's not he's gonna he's not um he might not be even be Evan Bouchard. Like he's not Adam Fox. He's not, you know, any of these guys that have, have been in the Norris conversation or that you look at and say, well, that's the guy who can be the linchpin for a championship team. But he's their guy. And Marner is a peripheral play, player in the playoffs, but he's he's one of their guys, you know. Like there's a, there's a number of, of things on that team that functionally would be fine if they if they had other pieces in place. Like, like Morgan Riley should be Shea Theodore behind someone else's Alex Peter Angelo, but they don't have that guy. You know what I mean? Um, so it, I, I, to answer your question, like you can double down with this core for one more year and then say goodbye to Tavares and Marner and get a goaltender and hope that it all works out. Or they can start answering the really tough questions of, okay, how do we change the makeup of this team around Austin Matthews and, and Willie Nylander? And and give them the tools they need to try to win a championship here. That, but uh, for the uh, extra long contracts for the Wild with a suitor and Paris State buyout, they have one more year left with that fourteen point seven million this year. I guess from a national perspective, what's reasonable expectations should there be for the Wild in this stretch when they have them? Is it like are they still meeting them or below expectations? By I mean, missing the playoffs is one thing this year, but it feels like there's been a lot of patience. I think from the fan base for this this group and, and trying to get there or is it like hey can't do anything until a year from now when they have a chance yeah i think it's probably like you have to wait until the cap situation gets cleared up a bit more before you can really dive right in um i don't know i was i was intrigued to see you know the the doubling down on on garen and uh and uh you know because there's there's just not been the level of success you'd probably want but um no, I think you have to kind of clear clear up the cap situation before anything else. Where do you think Steven Stamkos plays the start next season? Tampa. His stuff is there. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I, th I do think it's interesting that, you know, when they go and make the Ryan McDonough trade that they, you know, automatically talk about the n amount of money that they have to offer Stamkos and you know, proudly say we can afford them, but then it's like, all right, but like, what about the the parenthetical there of like, will will that be okay for him? <laughs> yeah, feel cool for you to say like you've got the money for him, but like it's another thing for him to want to take that money. When yeah, I, I think. Go ahead. I mean, I, I think he's gonna. I mean, I think it's best for both parties that he stays. Or I think it's. I think he wants to stay, and I do think he ends up there. But I think. I don't think he wants to break the bank, but I think he just wants to feel respected and wanted, right? Like not like the afterthought of like this is enough money we have left to, to pay you, I guess, in this aspect. But yeah. I find it hard to believe that they would get McDonough without knowing they're going to keep Stamkos or you know, yeah, you know, like that. I mean, that seems like a real. Think, 
a real kind of like a veteran add to a team that we understand is going to be having having its core comeback type move, like you know familiarity and all that. Me just embracing chaos. I want it to be that it looks like Nashville was being really nice and giving the McDonough, you know, do right by him when really they're just clearing space so that they can bring Stamkos there. Oh, I think he, I think they'd definitely be in the market for him. I think them, Boston, would be, make a lot of sense for him um, with their donut right now in their lineup. And uh, and I think Utah would make a lot of sense, too, in the sense that they're going to they're going to really push to make a, a huge splash, I think, in their first off season and um you know putting his face and name on a on a marquee outside the arena would probably go a long way in generating excitement how about detroit and cvy i mean makes sense too in, in the sense of like short-term veteran fix mm -hmm. to a problem that they clearly have which is you know a a, a, a top two center and I, want, I always i always get squirrely about besmirching the good name of dylan larkin by saying he's not a number one center but he's kind of on that borderline you know, and, and so bringing someone in that can bolster that position would be pretty smart. I don't know what his what his uh, relationship is with with Eiserman necessarily. I assume I assume it's better than Brisebois, but uh, but who knows? I mean, Eiserman, you would know better than me, Joe. <laughs> Eiserman scared away his best buddy. I mean, I I, I think he I mean, he obviously grew up as one of his idols as Eiserman. I think he a ton of respect for what he did in the organization. So I think. I think there's a good relationship there with him and 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 uh and Eisenman. So not that that'd be the number one thing why he'd go there, but I just think of places that have needs for that, a guy who could support Larkin and be a guy that can kind of be a finisher for them. But again, I think he ends up in Tampa. That's what I think, but we'll find out when yeah, the silly season true. begins. <clears throat> yeah, I think so too. Well, we have a question to wrap it up, Scott. I don't know uh how big of a golfer you are. Maybe we could do this for a different question. Good but golfer. Yeah. You can, I've been golfing it, once. I went. I went in Hawaii. I had a lot. Of, I had a lot of fun, but I have not been able to commit myself to the sport. All right, we'll spin this for you then. Um, so we've got our waggle golf question. Everyone, go to getyourwaggleon.com promo code SP10 if you want to take ten percent off your order. We usually ask who would be in your dream golf foursome, but for you, wish and it, you don't have to focus as much on the the subject matter. But if you're going out for a night of beers and you're going to be partaking in trivia for the night who are the three people you want to join your team win or lose oh in trivia mm -hmm. i mean that's it's an easy question uh you just take ken jennings uh <laughs> <laughs> uh what's the other dude's name from jeopardy the all-in guy the guy from vegas take him oh and then uh you know I, those are two like real brainiacs and then i would probably need I would want the guy who writes the uh, Cinematrix on Vulture.com to be the fourth because of their endless knowledge of film and award seasons and such. So it'd be the us four. Okay. You have to have a well-rounded team, right? You have to have people that know different categories, right? I guess Jennings yeah, everything. Exactly. So I guess, you know, but. Yeah, I figure the Jeopardy boys, you know, cover most of it, but, and I'll just be there to transport the beers from the bar to the table. <laughs> So aside from hockey, where would you be the one that excels in that group? Like, is there somewhere you're like, oh, yeah, I've got this covered? Um, yeah, pop music and, and music in general. I think I think I could be very strong there. I could fill in the blanks there. I'm, I'm usually very good in the audio categories. I have a, I have a very uh, weird brain that remembers random things, uh, songs, <laughs> you know, beats, things like that. So I, I do pretty well there. Nice. That's why you clean up. I think we did pretty well in Tampa when you were there. We think we did okay. Yeah. I think we were we were top two or top three in that uh, particular. We did one. a good job. Yeah, it was just yeah. like yeah, we, we we banged it out. Audio bad audio system and all. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, obviously, during the uh, the conference final here. Um, but yeah, check out the drop uh, on ESPN and obviously Greg's work there at ESPN.com and then. Um, go into the rabbit hole to find one of his favorite fandoms there. And that picture is not him on Twitter. So. <laughs> not me.